Anyway. <laughs> We're talking about oh, money. There's a tradition of having a collection for the staff. Part of me isn't happy with it. It feels a bit Downton Abbey. But I cannot stress how helpful the people here are. And therefore, I am certainly reluctant to say, no, we're not doing that. I would like a response from us in recognition of the way they looked out for us. So if you have any donation you'd like to make, I'll leave this there. Please don't get it confused with Catherine's stuff. Or she <laughs> shout at me and I cry easily. <laughs> <laughs> One final reminder, we're supposed to have vacated our rooms and handed the keys in by 11 o'clock. And if you haven't done it at about 5 to 11, somebody from reception might just pop in and say, have you got key 26 or what have you? So if you haven't, perhaps this is an opportune moment to dip home quickly. Anyway, thank you. Good morning. Um, I feel Hello? Yes. So I, I, I feel obviously it's likely fraudulent to introduce Catherine because she obviously needs absolutely no introduction here. Um, that we're making a, a little bit of history because in, in my 10 years uh, in, in, a, in this very, very demanding role as Vice President, it's the first time that I've been asked to step in. <laughs> the first time I've actually had to step in for our president, who lost her voice. <laughs> uh, but Catherine is, uh, yeah, uh, we've been in the provincial council together for now, about the, over, over 10 I'm years. I'm everything to not get re-elected, I'm trying incompetent. And, uh, <laughs> she's Nothing tried everything. Much. She's been a um, formation officer and now events and events officer. And as you know, she's extremely dedicated, hardworking. She can always be relied on to keep us in the, on the straight and narrow. She will always point out whenever we're about to get something wrong or have got something completely wrong. And she will very quickly correct it. And uh, so I don't know what we're going to do when she decides that she doesn't want to be there anymore. Uh, but she's also <laughs> extremely studious, very knowledgeable, and I'm sure we're in for a treat. So, Catherine. Yeah, I don't know how this microphone's going to work. It's not pointing at me, but like maybe it will vaguely pick up because um, the, the things are working. Anyway, so today... As leading on from the previous two um, keynote speakers, we're going to talk about the theological virtues, faith, hope, and love, um, which you will find in these parts of the Summa Theologiae, if you want to look. So in the Prima Secundae, you've got the overview of what the theological virtues are and how they interact with the other virtues. And then in the first part of the Secundae Secundae, you've got each of the theological virtues <coughs> in turn and um, the effects of it, and the gifts attached with it, and the vices that are opposed to it, and so on. However, um, because of this audience, I did a bit of a cop-out, yeah. because I know that Father Bob and Sister Magdalene did an excellent job of doing an overview of those questions that they had to deal with. I thought, I'm not going to competently be able to do that for such a diverse audience, where the theological formation amongst us is so varied. So I thought, instead of doing that, I'm just going to look at one issue, which is um, the relationship between the Eucharist and principally charity in Aquinas. And that way, whether you've studied Aquinas a lot or not, hopefully we'll be able to walk together on this journey. Um, it's not something that Thomas deals with in one individual question, so we're going to be drawing from different parts of the Summa in particular, but also occasionally from others of his writings. So I hope you're okay with that. If you wanted an overview of faith, hope and charity, yeah, you're welcome to leave right now. Um, so I like when I'm teaching to give people an idea of where we're going, just because it might give them some hope that there is going to be a light at the end of the tunnel if you're getting really bored, and um, and if you're tired, you can kind of fall asleep, and and I'll prod you when it gets to a bit you might be interested in. Um, you can let me know. So firstly, we're going to have a look at what it means to say that the Eucharist is the sacrament of charity, this genitive of charity. And also included in that, um, whether we receive charity, whether charity is infused into us through the Eucharist. You can see from point two that I'm going to argue that it is, 
because two is, is, is it, does it also increase or infuse other virtues? So as well as charity, do we get other virtues from receiving the Eucharist? Um, I'm going to answer yes to that as well, just giving my hand away there. Then we're going to go on to look at the unity of the virtues. So why is the answer yes to number two? It's because of all the virtues working together, which Father David talked about yesterday. So we're going to have a recap of that. And then having a look, if we've got time, at what Thomas says the effects of charity are. So um, in, the, in the moral virtues, these might be called the parts of the virtue, but in the theological virtues, we call them the effects, the effects of this, of this um, virtue of charity. That's if we get time. If we don't get time for that, I'll just tell you quickly what they are, and you can go, oh, they're marvellous. I'm glad I've got all of those, because I've got charity. Um, so having a look then. Um, I'm going to do a quick overview of one paragraph. If you don't get it, don't worry. It's going to break down afterwards. What precisely is the link between charity and the Eucharist? The, first of all, the effects of Christ's sacrifice on the cross are communicated to and through the church in the sacraments, especially the sacrament of the Eucharist. That's one level. On another level, faith and charity are necessary prerequisites to receiving the sacrament spiritually in the first place, or else there'd only be a dead, or what Thomas calls a sacramental eating, without receiving the effects, um, what's called the res tantum. Are you all okay if I use those sacramentum tantum, res et sacramentum? Yeah, are we all? Okay. Tell me if you're not, because it, it does come up again. Um, and so what Thomas says there is that faith and charity, or this is on the other side, also constitute the principal effects of the sacrament. And his words are, whereby a person is spiritually united to Christ through faith and charity. That's in question 80 of the Tertia Pass. And in a particular way, the Eucharist is called the sacrament of charity since it constitutes the church as the living body of Christ, united by charity. So we've got charity initially leads the Christian to desire the Eucharist, a desire which is consummated when the Eucharist, which is received, creates and increases charity within the soul. So we're going to break that down a bit. Looking at this, this is my lovely first communicant class from last year, and there's Jesus in the, the Eucharist. This circularity of movement of faith and love in the Eucharist, which both... Um, pre-existing in the communicant before the reception of the Eucharist and to a much more important degree is created by the reception. So we might loosely call this a symbiotic relationship as long as you're not an actual scientist. <laughs> it's certainly not one of two equal partners. So that's to say the charity which is the gift of God in the Eucharist infinitely exceeds the charity that the soul already possesses. Um, and if we look at it like this, <laughs> so here's our charity for God, which is a bit dodgy, and it's more or less going in the right direction. But, um, you know, and then the charity which God infuses into us is going to be direct and to the point and solid and strong. And, you know, that's all great. Um, there's a minimum level of charity needed then in order to receive the sacrament spiritually. Or if we want to put it the opposite way around, which um, some of the older people amongst the room were probably taught in the catechism as children, while you receive the Eucharist while not in a state of grace is a further grave sin to add to what has already occasioned the loss of charity. So that's the same as saying that as long as you've got this minimum level of being in a state of grace, then you're going to receive a lot more back. Um, but if we do approach the altar while in a state of mortal sin, Aquinas teaches we would still receive the reset sacramentum and the sacramentum tantrum, so we still receive the Eucharist sacramentally, um, that's because metaphysically it would be very poor um, Eucharistic theology to try to maintain that the Eucharistic body of Christ is only present in the Eucharist when received worthily by a member of Christ's true body, and that his, his sacramental presence would cease to be there if, um, if the wrong person received. But this person would only receive under a sacramental sign and none of the benefits that are associated with the Eucharist. So the res tantum of the sacrament is received only by those who approach the sacrament <coughs> with a faith animated by charity. So charity isn't needed in order to be able to physically touch the sacramental body of Christ, but in order to receive the effects of the sacrament in the soul. For the person who does not have this minimum level of charity, there's no true communion. And for the one who does have even a minimum amount of charity, I'm, I'm not like singling my first communion for <laughs> charity, they're great. Um, that's just a picture I had. Um, but even a small amount of genuine charity, the Eucharist will then bring an incommensurable increase. So, in summary, we've got three senses in which we can say that the Eucharist is a sacrament of charity. Firstly, that it contains Christ, who, as God is love, is charity, and as a human possesses the fullness of all virtue. 
Secondly, and that as we've just been talking about, it requires there to be charity already in the soul of the recipient for it to be fully and properly received. And thirdly, in that <coughs> it truly creates and increases charity in the soul of the recipient who receives it spiritually. And this third sense, because um, that's why I put it in red, is the principle and the key meaning and the one which we're now going to look into further. So Aquinas goes so far as to say that not only is this the sacrament of charity, but that it is charity itself. That's in uh, question 79 of the tertiary parts. The reality of this sacrament is charity. So we're going to have a look in a bit more detail about what Thomas says about how charity is infused through the Eucharist. And after that, as I said, whether he thinks that other virtues also could be infused through this sacrament. Uh, in the Summa Theologiae, he frequently uses this phrase, sacramentum caritatis, in reference of the Eucharist, and sometimes sacrament of faith. But he doesn't go deeper into how this can be said to be true. Um, instead, when he explores the effects of the Eucharist, he looks at general topics, um, forgiveness of sins, protection from future sin, the attainment of glory, and then when he's talking about grace, he just uses a blanket term, bestowal of grace. Um, he devotes a lot more space to how and why the Eucharist bestows grace than what grace in particular it does bestow. There are four aspects of the, under which he um, looks at bestow, the bestowal of grace in the Eucharist. This is in question 79, Article 1 of the Tertiary Pars. The most expansive is the second, which is highlighted in green at the, near the top there. Secondly, the effect of this sacrament is considered on the part of what is represented by this sacrament, which is Christ's passion, as stated above. And therefore, this sacrament works in man the effect which Christ's passion wrought in the world. So I think this is useful because it means we can cross-reference this passage with the question on the effects of the passion, and then we can reach a fuller picture of what Aquinas might envisage these <coughs> effects to be. So in talking about the passion, he's much more forthcoming about the effects for humanity from Christ's sacrifice. Um, so you've got the ones that we already listed, uh, deliverance from sin, justification through grace, and the promise of future glory. You've also got the knowledge that God loves us, which provokes charity in response, the provision of an exemplar of all the virtues, which is a, a separate thing for him, and the other effects, which are a bit less relevant here. Um, I hope you're all okay with the idea of uh, an exemplary cause, because that came up yesterday, so we're, we're happy with that? Good. Um, so he doesn't state here that the virtue, not here, but in, um, in the effects of the passion, that uh, the virtues are infused in people through the passion, but merely that the passion is an exemplary cause of the virtues in us. So, so far, there's no indication that the passion itself or the Eucharist, which is its representation, are directly the cause of charity within us in anything other than an exemplary sense. So we'll come back to this question, 79. Um, the other modes, apart from what's represented by the sacrament, the passion, he looks at uh, number one at the top, that it contains Christ shows that the Eucharist is life-giving. The third one, that it is food and drink, shows that it works by sustaining, giving increase, restoring and giving delight. And the Eucharistic species, the fourth one, that it signifies, um, or maybe that it produces, because the, the wording at this stage isn't clear, um, but that it signifies the unity, which is the church. Um, and charity does get an explicit mention eventually, right at the end, you can see that other bit highlighted in green, which is a quote from Augustine, O sacrament of piety, O sign of unity, O bond of charity. Um, but he doesn't give any explanation as to how it's the bond of charity. So if we just looked at this first article of the question, which sometimes people do because that's your key headline, kind of what are the effects of the Eucharist, um, we might get the impression that Thomas is unwilling, or maybe that he just didn't consider it necessary, to state explicitly that the, the Eucharist actually produces charity in the soul. But if we look a bit further in the question, we're going to find more evidence for this. Uh, there's one line in the Ad Secundum of the first article, which says, this sacrament confers grace spiritually together with the virtue of charity. Um, Grammatically, that's a bit ambiguous. I won't go into why, because this isn't a linguistics lesson, but I'm going to argue that once we've understood it in the context of the, the other parts, it's not ambiguous. It means what we think it means, that this sacrament confers the virtue of charity as well as conferring grace. Um, so, uh, when we look, the reason why I think it says that is because when we look further in the article, you can see in Article 8, we've got this quote here, which in a longer context, we can sum up the bit in green. The effect of this sacrament is the obtaining of charity. Obviously, there's more around that, but that's the unequivocal teaching in there. 
um, which solves the ambiguity in the Ad Secundum of Article 1. And then we get it even more forcefully in the Ad Secundum of that article, Article 8. Baptism is not ordained as the Eucharist is for the further of charity as its actual effect. So my argument thus far has been that the Eucharist is a cause of charity in us. And I hope you will agree that Thomas thinks that. And I hope you will agree that it's true. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> They're not always the same thing, but they often coincide. <laughs> so, um, so we've had that, the, uh, the sacrament of charity part. You will be happy to hear. Look, we're, uh, unfortunately, it's not a quarter of the way through because that fourth part is quite long. But um, <laughs> we're, uh, we're going to move on to the second part which is, does the Eucharist then also include, also cause the increase or the infusion of other virtues? Which obviously is what I want to argue. Um, it was difficult to find, as you saw, explicit evidence that Thomas believes charity to be caused by the Eucharist, and it's even harder to find evidence for the other virtues. Um, in the Summa Theologiae, there's only occasional mentions, mentions of virtue in the singular, uh, which may or may not res refer exclusively to charity. Um, for example, there's this quote, which is from the, oh, still from Question 79, Article 1. Consequently, through the Eucharist, as far as its power is concerned, not only is the habit of grace and of virtue bestowed, but it is furthermore aroused to act. So he just says virtue, and that's open to interpretation. Is that one particular virtue or virtue in general? Happily, for me, this exact topic is discussed elsewhere in the fourth book of the Commentary on the Sentences, uh, briefly, but he does go into it. So he expressly states that the particular way in which the grace comes to the recipient through the Eucharist is by the increase of virtues, as we can see here. Increase of spiritual quality in the increase of virtues, plural. And just to prove that, I've got the Latin here, so you can see I'm not lying. Um, virtutum, genitive plural, there we go, definitely he <laughs> says this. Okay. Um, and then he goes on, he doesn't specify precisely which virtues, so there's, there's no list of virtues that are implicated, but it is very clearly a plural. And he goes on to explain, expand this when answering the three objections to this questincula. Um, and they all relate to the plurality of virtues given through the Eucharist, or as the objectors argue, not given. Um, in response to the first objection, he demonstrates that even though an increase in the virtues can come through all the sacraments, since, he says, it is in their nature to cause grace, yet there is a special way in which increase is caused by the union of nourishment, and this properly begons, belongs to the Eucharist. So as in the respondeo, there's a plural use of the word virtue, and he doesn't specify in particular which virtue. Is it just theological virtues? Is it also moral and intellectual infused virtues? Um, the second objection... Um, the objector does say the other virtues and Thomas doesn't answer that in, the, in his response. He just talks about charity, but he doesn't deny it either. He neither affirms nor denies that it's a plural. <coughs> and then the third one is the, um, the third objector claims that all virtues increase together and if therefore the increase of virtues were the effect of the sacrament, the effect could not include a greater increase in charity than in other virtues. So um, the, the objector's thinking that if we just get all the virtues together as a lump, then that's not fair because we should get more charity than other stuff. And Thomas then answers that uh, the increase of charity more than other virtues is attributed to this sacrament, but um, he doesn't... Uh, what am I going to say? He's, he gives a preeminence, a priority to charity, and I don't think that's controversial because the Eucharist is the sacrament of charity, but I think what is interesting is the place given to the other sacraments, and that's, that's something to note. Uh, sorry, not the other sacraments, the other virtues. Um, he seems to hold that the virtues as a group are given through the Eucharist. So there's not a whole load of evidence for this if you're looking for real, real, like, textual um, evidence that he definitely taught that all the virtues can come to us through the sacraments. This is why I'm going to rely on the idea that the, the unity of the virtues, which we'll come to in a sec. Um, but I think there's enough evidence that it's, it's there as a theme, that we can hold that although he didn't return to this theme in the summer for whatever really reason, he, I would argue, continued to hold that along with charity in the lead, the other virtues are what make up the grace that's given through the Eucharist in the present time as the form of sanctification which unites the recipient to Christ and to the Church. So my argument is that the virtuous life is Eucharistically formed. 
and this is why. So you see now we're going to be on the third part, the unity of the virtues. So this is in order to understand how all the virtues could come to us through the Eucharist, the sacrament of charity, we have to take a little time to look at the unity of virtues, which, as I said, Father David did for us very admirably yesterday, so hopefully you've got that all fresh in your mind, this is just a little review with some textual evidence behind it. Um, so charity is necessary for Aquinas as the cornerstone of the virtues because it directs them to their proper end. The acquired virtues can only ever perfect the possessor in a natural accomplishment to a natural end, and the virtue of charity is needed to direct the person's actions towards a supernatural end, and the infused moral virtues then are the only ones fitted to working with charity to achieve this. Um, and this is what um, he's saying here, especially the pipe harnessing grid. It's evident that charity, in as much as it directs man to his last end, is the principle of all good works that are referable to his last end, wherefore all the moral virtues must need to be infused together with charity. Why does charity have to be in charge? Why can't it be temperance or whatever, or fortitude that is the in charge, and charity is one of the, the lesser virtues? So what Thomas would teach is that none of the other virtues by themselves are going to lead to the full flourishing of the human being. They're going to set boundaries in place so that flourishing will be made possible. Um, Joseph Pieper has a, a nice image of the human will being a stream and the, uh, the moral virtues being the banks and the ramparts of that stream. So they're, they're providing boundaries to the edge, but they're not going to lead it to the, the full fulfillment, the, the sea of fulfillment, he calls it. Um, it's not itself the stream, but it's what provides the, the limits, the guardrails around it. But with charity to form it, these, um, these moral virtues can be directed to the principal good, which is, it, well, the last end, so the enjoyment of God. And this is what Thomas says in uh, question 23 of the Secunde Secunde. The, um, it can contribute to the upbuilding of a person who is not nearly, sorry, not <laughs> merely naturally morally excellent, but fitted for a supernatural end. So this is a very common theme in medieval theology. This is not just something Thomas made up. These are called trees of virtue. You get these all over the place. Um, and they usually, I didn't put a tree of vice there, but you usually get them next to <laughs> a picture of a tree of vice where all the leaves are pointing down. So you see in a tree of virtue, right up the top, you've got the new Adam, Christ. And right underneath him, directly underneath him, you'll have charity, and then the other theological virtues on either side, and then the moral and intellectual virtues with their various parts are the, the leaves coming out of them um, below that. And the point is that when you look at the tree of virtue, these are all inter interconnected. They're all growing out of the same branches and roots, and they're all um, united to each other. So this is just how the, how the view of theology worked. And it still works today. I mean, this, is, this is a good picture, okay? I like it, this. <laughs> Let's not say that there's... Anyway, whatever. Um, so, even though all the virtues are united under charity, there at the top, the other virtues are not useless in the sense that charity, although it is the form of them all, cannot replace them. There's a genuine need for the moral and intellectual and theological virtues, <coughs> even in the person who's advanced in charity. Um, Thomas says that charity is the form of the other virtues, not as being their exemplar or their essential form, but rather by way of efficient cause, and it is the foundation and root of the other virtues and their end, because it directs all the other virtues to its own end. <coughs> so, despite the absolutely central role of charity, Thomas argues that charity alone cannot suffice. The other virtues are distinct from it, and each is necessary in their own way. So he says that, therefore, insofar as the good is diversified in man, it is necessary that virtue too be diversified. It should be noticed, however, that there is a twofold good of man, one of which is proportional to his nature, another of which exceeds the capacity of his nature. So that's the acquired and infused virtues. Charity is not sufficient per se to account for a virtuous life. The moral virtues are also needed. So when an objector claims that the other virtues are superfluous as long as one has charity, which is uh, what the spiritual Franciscans were going for at Thomas's time, we can look <coughs> at Thomas's answer, which is the lower power as well as the higher power has to be um, perfected. So, when we look at the middle, we need not only a virtue disposing him well to the end, which is charity, but also those virtues which dispose him well to whatever is referred to the end, so along the way, the other virtues that we need. So it's necessary to have the moral virtues together with charity. 
hopefully it's perhaps clearer now why I was keen to establish that the Eucharist is the cause in us not only of charity, but also of the moral virtues and all the virtues. So, okay, we're doing all right for time, but that's fine. So now we can move on to this bit that I like, which is the effects of charity. <coughs> the effects of charity, um, which is what we're going to look at for the rest of the talks, I'm going to look at as a kind of test case for how the life of theological virtue operates within us. Of all the potential consequences of a devout reception of the Eucharist, I think the most indisputable place must go to these things that Thomas calls the effects of charity, and especially to the interior effects. I think we're on slightly shakier ground with the exterior effects, but we'll, we'll get to that. Um, he doesn't enter into detail about how these qualities come to be. It doesn't appear, for instance, that he thinks they need to be infused separately in the same way as the theological virtues, and certainly not that they must be acquired through human effort like natural moral virtues. So it appears as though the effects of charity follow without hindrance or further intervention, either divine or human, from possessing the virtue itself, from possessing, in this case, charity itself. So although these effects are not listed as being amongst the effects of the Eucharist, we can state with confidence that it's in keeping with Thomas's theology that they should be linked in this way. So here we've got what they are. Mercy, peace and joy are the internal effects of charity and beneficence, almsgiving and fraternal correction are the external effects of charity. Uh, yeah, I'm just checking I'm in the right place on the slides. They have, these ones have the more obviously ecclesial role, the external effects, um, so they're causal links to the Eucharist. We will deal with if we've got time for, but if not, we won't worry too much about them. But be grateful that if you have charity in your soul, which I'm very sure you all do, you've got all of these things going on with it. Yay! <laughs> so, um, if we're looking at the interior effects, joy, peace and mercy, of these, mercy stands out as being deemed as a, a separate virtue from charity whereas um, joy and peace are simply parts of charity. They're not distinct virtues. We'll go on in a minute if we get time to see why that is. Mercy is not merely a virtue, but by some reckoning it's the greatest of all virtues. Thomas has a, a debate about whether it is or not. Um, he says there's two ways to judge a virtue, in itself and in relation to its subject. So the subject is the person who has that virtue. Um, in itself, mercy is above all the other virtues, since only one who is above others may have mercy on them. I'm going to explain this in pictorial form in a minute. Um, it's a virtue whose possessor is, by definition, superior to those upon whom she has mercy. Thus, mercy is mo most properly ascribed to God himself. But even between humans, it's the greatest of all virtues which relates to our neighbour, as it belongs to the one who is higher and better. We'll see this in a sec. In terms of its subject, so this is the other way he argues it, charity is to be preferred to mercy in humans, since for him who has anyone above him, it is better to be united to that which is above than to supply the defect of that which is beneath. Uh, what he means by that is that it's impossible to show mercy to God, and while we have God above us, it would be better to have charity for him than to have mercy for people beneath us. Um, so the virtue of charity which binds us to God in friendship is to be preferred, even then, that's only true of someone who has someone above her. For God himself, there's no restraint on mercy because he has no superior or equal, and therefore his mercy is the greatest. So we're going to have a look at an illustration to make it simpler. Um, obviously, Thomas is not thinking about money as like rich and poor, but this is an easy way to illustrate what he means by superior and inferior, if we're just looking at kind of how society works. So um, the rich guy is able to have mercy on the poor woman because he's able to supply what she doesn't have. However, she is not able to have mercy on him because she doesn't have what he needs. Obviously, when we're talking about mercy in a spiritual sense, she may well have what he lacks, and in that case, she could give him something. But if we just need an easy picture for it, we're going, he's got money, she doesn't have money. Okay, so that's a one-way street for mercy. Um, and when we're talking about God... This man, if we're talking, he's the subject from his point of view, he can have charity for God, um, but he cannot have charity, so he cannot have mercy for God, he can have mercy or charity for the one who's beneath him. Um, so similar to the external effects of charity, mercy is intricately linked with our relationship with other people and therefore with the, the upbuilding of the church. Um, Thomas defines mercy according, he follows Augustine's definition, as a heartfelt sympathy for another's distress, impelling us to succour him if we can, 
and he uses the etymology of misericordia to demonstrate that it's a person's compassion at heart for another's unhappiness. So it's a virtue which is only ever in act while it's directed towards another person. There's no such thing as mercy without an object. Um, that's in contrast to joy and peace, the other internal effects, which are, to a certain extent, more self-contained. They, they always proceed from love of God, and they always have God as their source and object, but there's not always a human object, as there is with mercy. So Thomas then goes on to answer the question. Uh, we might think of it as a strange question, but it's, um, it's coming from a philosophical tradition where mercy is seen as something bad, like a weakness, something that's wrong with you if you show mercy on someone else. So his question is whether the person who takes pity does so by reason of a defect in herself. And he gives two causes of mercy, both of which concern our relationship to others. The second one, which I'm going to deal with first, um, because I think this is anyway, whatever. The second one is that there's a real union, a real union between the sufferer and the one who pities her. This means that the, the situation of the afflicted person, here in the middle, risks affecting the one who pities, either by actually suffering the same thing, because of their proximity to one another, or because the one who pities is endowed with empathy, and it makes them realise, this is Thomas's words, it makes them realise that the same may happen to themselves, and therefore they are merciful to the other. Um, this is what he calls a union of circumstances, and it could apply to anybody, but the union through empathy is more common in certain groups of people, um, and he lists, and we're going to go on to it here, the elderly, the wise... <laughs> Um, who consider that they may fall upon evil times and also those of a more timorous disposition. Um, so uh, up in the top right there, you've got someone who's united by a union of circumstances, so also is liable to suffer similar herself and therefore can have um, pity, and then the other three who just by the type of person that they are <coughs> are more likely either to suffer misfortune, so he considers... Um, I mean, he's not very explicit, but I think he thinks that if you're elderly you know, hard times are going to come anyway, so you're probably used to that. And, um, uh, and certainly if you're wise, that's not a defect in you. That's, um, you consider that you may fall upon evil times. Um, so they're either more likely, in fact, to suffer themselves, or they're more likely to believe that they will. And by contrast, the strong and the powerful are less likely to consider their own frailty and their dependence on providence, and therefore they're less likely to pity others in their suffering. So, um, I think here. Oh, yes. I have become rich and powerful entirely through my own effort. This destitute woman must just be a lazy idiot. Um, so, um, because, um, so Thomas is not very kind towards these people. He, he thinks that it's a, a sin of pride to, to, lack, um, to lack mercy on someone because it means that we're not aware of our own dependence on providence, of the fact that the same could very easily happen to us. So the other reason why Thomas thinks that um, it could be a cause for mercy, apart from a real union, is called a union of affections. So pity is grief for another's distress, and since sorrow or grief is about one's own, Ill, one, one's own ills, one grieves or sorrows for another's distress insofar as one looks upon another's distress as one's own. That's from uh, question 30 of the Secundi Secundi. Um, so we can regard the distress as our own, as we've already discussed, through a real union, but also, interestingly, we've got this union of love. The effect of love is to consider the friend as another self, and therefore, when the friend is afflicted, the one who pities counts his friend's hurt as his own, so that he grieves for his friend's hurt as though he were hurt himself. So this is what's going on in this guy's mind, that he's um, realising that there's an in <coughs> his friend is equivalent to himself, Again, don't get all sciencey on me. That, that's probably seen as a mathematical symbol. Um, so, love for Thomas is the cause of mercy, not in some ill defined, nebulous way, but directly. Pity stems from the union of friendship and is immediately caused by the very nature of friendship love, which adopts the friend as another self. And Aquinas notes that God pities humanity in this way only, not from a real union, but from a union of affections. So it's a supremely Christian virtue, and as I sort of previously alluded to, alluded to, it's a uniquely Christian virtue in that it wasn't prized highly by the ancient philosophers. Since it um, proves the union of love between persons, the constitution of which is the very bond of the church. 
The ability to see the friend as another self exceeds the standard definition of mercy, which considers that the one who shows mercy is stronger than the one to whom it is shown, and the weaker party needs to be pitied because she cannot help herself and needs external support. Certainly for Aquinas, there does need to be some disparity between the parties so that one is able, in a position, to offer mercy to the other, which is normally because they have something the other lacks, so there's some condition of superiority. But the major thrust of his argument is that um, both in the, quote, in the case of God showing mercy and in the case of, of human beings showing mercy between them, <coughs> um, charity is the cause of mercy, and charity, meaning that the one towards whom mercy is shown is regarded as another self, draws mercy to surpass itself by being greater than the mere empathetic response to another's distress. In charity, the distinction between the superior and the inferior person is effaced in the union between the two. As we saw yesterday, friendship requires a certain equality between friends. So the other two effects of charity, uh, internal effects, joy and peace, as already mentioned, are not considered by Thomas to be independent virtues, but they're necessary results of possessing charity. Um, he reasons this because they're not operative habits by themselves, they're an act or an effect of charity, which he says do not add to love any special aspect that might cause a special virtue. You might not be that bothered about that. He's just saying, why is hope a separate virtue from love and joy and peace aren't? So he has a, a good answer for why not, but don't write too much about it. We'll move on. Um, so we remember that charity is not any love, but it's a participation in God's own love with God as the object of beatitude. And this is where Th Thomas starts his exposition of joy. Um, and from the very fact, this is here, that God is loved, he is in those who love him by his most excellent effect. Excuse me while I just reach for a drink. Feel free to read. <laughs> so the spiritual joy, which is the effect of charity, works in a way parallel to how the passion of joy proceeds from the passion of love. Joy is caused either by the presence of the person or the thing loved, or because the proper good of the person loved exists and endures in it, in, in the beloved. So I can rejoice either because I'm with my friend or because my friend has what they need and is, is happy in themselves. Um, whereby a man rejoices in the well-being of his friend, though he be absent. That's from question 28. So all these parts are question 28 to 30 of the second second. Um, both of these causes of joy exist in the case of spiritual joy um, because we've seen God is present in and um, to those who have charity for him and his proper good which is his essence necessarily exists in him and therefore it's a cause of joy for those who love him um, and we also break down not in our time for the next slide yet we have a twofold spiritual joy in God the first way is that we can rejoice in the divine goodness considered in itself, and that proceeds from charity alone. And the second is to rejoice in the divine goodness insofar as we participate in it. And that comes from charity, but also from hope, although it's perfected and formed according to the measure of our charity. And since on the, um, in via, on, on our earthly journey, we do not yet participate as fully as we could in the divine goodness, and, like, obviously, because otherwise there'd be nothing better to come. <coughs> the second type of joy allows us both to rejoice and to be sorrowful simultaneously, um, insofar as we can grieve for that which hinders the participation of the divine good, either in us or in our neighbour, whom we love as ourselves. But this first type of spiritual joy, to rejoice in the divine goodness in itself, um, cannot be, is, is incompatible with sorrow because God's goodness is perfect. So they both proceed, both these aspects of joy, from the infused theological virtues, faith, uh, sorry, charity and hope, especially charity, so we can state with confidence that they come to us through the Eucharist. And I think this is peculiarly fitting because <coughs> contemplation of the Eucharist gives rise to both these species of joy. Uh, the divine good as participated in by the recipient is the sine qua non of the Eucharist. So this is Thomas's Eucharistic hymn. <coughs> <coughs> for Vespers of um, Corpus Christi, um, in which Christ is received, uh, the memory of his passion is recorded, the, the mind is filled with grace and the pledge of future glory is given to us. So that is what it's about, the divine good as participated in by the recipient of the Eucharist. Um, and the divine good participated in itself may be less obviously connected to the Eucharist, 
but it's nonetheless present as the Eucharist could be said to make the divine life accessible to the human mind in a way that would ordinarily be hidden. Okay, so that's joy. Moving on, we've got the final interior effect, which is peace. Um, how much do you want to hear about peace and how much do you want to have time to talk? Okay, we'll say a little bit about peace. Uh, there's quite a lot to say about it because it's, um, he's got to separate it from what's called concord. Concord is just what looks like peace between different people, whereas peace, in addition to that, has the union of appetites within each person so that she is at peace with herself as well as with, uh, with others. So peace, peace includes concord, but not vice versa. Um, both ends of peace, the concord with others and the peace within oneself, are affected by charity. Um, what I will skip over is that basically um, you can have concord even if you're evil. You can't have true peace if you're evil because there will be within yourself a search for goodness. So even if all your appetites and powers are directed to searching for evil, there will be some part of you that still wants the good. And even when that evil is presented as good, there's some search for good. So you can never be truly at peace within yourself while you're directed towards an evil end. So you can be seemingly at peace with others if you're all looking towards the same evil end, but there will never be true peace unless there's charity at its heart. Um, so we're going to skip over all of that and then go to how it comes to us through the Eucharist. I think as a manifestation of charity, it has quite a, a strong claim to come to us through the Eucharist, um, especially because when we look at Christ's promise of peace to the disciples, it comes during the Last Supper discourse, and so it's intimately tied to the institution of the Eucharist. And when we look at the commentary on John, when discussing the line, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you, Aquinas reiterates what he's already said in the Summa, that peace is nothing else than the tranquility arising from order. Uh, remember what Father Bob said, didn't know Father Bob is, what Father Bob said about order within the human person, so the, the powers of the soul and the intellect and the will being in good order within the person, the hierarchy of how the human person should be working. Um, in the commentary on John, um, he does spend quite a bit of time talking about whether Christ appropriately assigns to himself the action of giving peace, which um, should more properly be attributed to the Holy Spirit, and his conclusion, which we could argue, and like, thankfully he does pad it out elsewhere, because um, it's a bit um, wishy-washy here, is because the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Son, actions which are appropriate to the Holy Spirit are attributed to the Son. You will be happy to hear that Thomas's Trinitarian theology is robust, and, and there are other things that he says elsewhere. Um, though Thomas himself doesn't make an explicit link back to the Eucharist, he's clearly established that it's true to say that peace comes to us through Christ, and then there's no difficulty in saying that it could come to Christ to us through Christ's gift of himself in the Eucharist. Um, so I think that in a historical sense, peace has the most clear link with the Eucharist. Okay, we're just going to really quickly whiz through what the external effects of charity are. I am not going to argue that they come to us through the Eucharist, um, and I think they're exception rather than the rule. Um, but I will just tell you what they are. So you've got <coughs> um, beneficence is a, a simple act of charity. It's doing good to one's friends, which naturally proceeds from loving them. Um, and then almsgiving is an act of mercy, which is itself an act of charity. So it comes to us through possessing mercy. And fraternal correction, it can be a type of justice. There's another type of fraternal correction that comes under justice. But this one, he says if it's proper fraternal correction, is to procure someone's good by driving away the evil that is in her, and therefore it's an act of charity. Um, so I think it's much clearer with the external effects that they principally refer to acts rather than to habits, and so their link to the Eucharist is a, is a bit more tenuous, I'm going to admit that. But for the other virtues and the effects of charity that I've discussed, I believe there is a strong case for arguing for a reading of Aquinas that would allow the Eucharist to be the means for their infusion, and increase within our souls. In the present age, the fruit of the Eucharist is principally charity, but also the other virtues. And the life of virtue is the form which results from the proper reception of the sacrament, first of all here and now in the present age, and afterwards fulfilled by a full flourishing of charity in the next life. So my argument has been that in Thomas's thought, as I understand it, the virtuous life is Eucharistically formed. Thank you.